know that people who feel that they have strategies for managing pain do better than people who feel pretty helpless in the face of their pain. And so that's often a goal of, of treatment as well, is what can we do to help people feel they have a real uh, menu of options. I think it can be very helpful for people to also look at um, what things are they no longer doing and what can we as healthcare providers do to help them get back to doing that. So often as part of a rehabilitation plan for pain, goals might include getting back to activities that are enjoyed, finding new ways to do activities that don't trigger more pain but that help people have a fuller life, looking at learning strategies to decrease pain and to live a, a more full life. So pain relief is certainly a goal but oftentimes if you pursue some of those other activities, you gain in those areas areas and pain relief can be a side effect of, of becoming more engaged or connected in your life. Things like relaxation training, uh, mindfulness meditation, exercise, uh, staying active in social activities, uh, valued activities. Also some people will deliberately try to distract themselves. I had one person who loved to watch funny movies when he was having a pain flare up because that really helped him. Acupuncture has been studied and has had an effect on pain. Biofeedback has been studied. Massage has been studied. All of these things have an effect on pain. I mean, certainly people need to talk with their providers about what makes sense for them, but we know that people who exercise and stay active tend to have less pain, and their pain tends to be less uh, disruptive in their lives. And so a big part of pain management is having a, a plan for either staying active or if you're not active, getting active. So we know that stress makes pain worse. You know, actively looking at what's causing stress for a person and finding ways to manage that stress can also often result in uh, better pain management. Another thing that people find helpful is really looking at their self-talk. And we all have these internal dialogues in our head of, of, of us talking to ourselves. And for people with pain, uh, if those thoughts are negative or unhelpful, people tend to do worse. And we know that people who kind of deliberately try to uh, nurture more helpful thoughts, thoughts like, I've been through this before, I have a plan to manage it, um, they tend to do better. As soon as you start feeling oh, my feet are hurting, I feel worse today, am I gonna have another attack? You're, you just go down this negative spiral. But if you stop, and I literally, like on my walk, I'll, I, my feet are hurting and I'll just say, oh, stop, look for something beautiful, take deep breath, and then I get out of that mode. I stop thinking about why I'm hurting. You know, I get away from that pain thought spiral. There have been clinical trials to look at pain management and MS. One that was done in England with 600 folks and they did find that there was some efficacy with uh, treating pain with m cannabis. The kind of cannabis was not smoked but it was Sativex which was an, a buccal oral spray sprayed into the mouth, certain amount of sprays per day, that was the dose, and that uh, was efficacious in managing pain. What happened with that management of pain was that folks didn't get psychotropic effects from that delivery of cannabis. So cannabis, in the way that is used in the United States, is smoked. There are 16 states and the District of Columbia that have now have medical marijuana laws on the books. There's four times more tar in a marijuana cigarette than there is in a nicotine cigarette. You don't hear much about lung cancer, but it's definitely a threat. A wonderful article came out in the Neurology Journal about a year ago that looked at cognitive function. They found that folks who were habitual smokers of marijuana had far less ability to think properly, poor memory. We don't know enough about the effects of marijuana. We are studying that. There are many trials right now that are looking at cannabinoid receptors in the brain, but I would caution people not to smoke marijuana when it has such an impact on cognitive function. I think that the important principle is that managing pain is often not a one solution um, task. It, it often involves really calling upon a number of different strategies and, and applying those depending on how your day is going. And as a person with MS and pain, you are in charge of managing it. You might see a healthcare provider a few times a year or even a few times a month, but on the day-to-day -day stuff, you're the one managing it. And so that's why it's important to really be the center of the team who's managing the pain. And that also, I think, implies a very proactive approach. People who manage pain and, and who are best able to, to either decrease it or not let it get in their way tend to be people who are very proactive about their pain.
tends to be a very labor-intensive process. It's not something that you can walk into the doctor's office and say, I have a sore throat, and the doctor makes a quick determination that you have strep throat, and he or she gives you penicillin, and you get all better, and that's the end of it. It's something that involves a process. It involves a lot of time up front. It involves treatment with a lot of different interventions and there can be side effects and barriers to the implementation of those interventions. What are some of the barriers? Some of the barriers might be you, the patient. You may not want to feel like, like your pain is uh, very important. Other things may be more important when you have that 15 minute talk with your provider. It may be that you want to know more about walking or bladder control. Patients also feel that they don't want to be on medicines for pain. They may not want to take the medicines. They may not want to have the side effects. Less is better, and, and people get that message, but that doesn't always help manage pain. I think we often approach it as providers from a medical perspective where we're trying to treat it with medications, and there's really a host of other things that can be beneficial to people's pain, but, but often if the medications fail, people think, well, there's nothing more I can do about it, and I just have to tolerate it. Right now, there is no way for us to measure somebody's pain. So patients can come in and their pain may be a manifestation of depression, or their pain may be a manifestation of a kidney stone, or their pain might be a manifestation of a lesion in their brain or their spinal cord, but there's no way for us to distinguish where that pain is really coming from and exactly what the patient's experience is with that pain. Well, functional MRI is a non-invasive magnetic resonance imaging method for looking at brain activity. And the way we measure or infer which areas of the brain are active is based on the uh, blood flow and oxygenation levels that we see in the different areas of the brain. So it's just like any regular MRI that patients have except we have them doing a task and instead of looking at the difference between say gray and white brain tissue or lesion versus non-lesion tissue in our case we're using it to look at what areas of the brain are active during pain processing. The way we're using functional MRI to measure pain is before we ever get down to the scanner we up here in the office determine a person's mild pain threshold and we're using a pressure stimulation where we put pressure on the thumb using a, a graded um, standardized procedure to identify when that amount of pressure just tips over into a painful sensation. So that's their mild pain threshold. And then we take the same equipment, we go down to the scanner, and we use that level of stimulation, that amount of pressure, interspersed with periods of rest where there's no pressure. In functional MRI, you always need a contrast. We're always looking for what areas are active during a certain condition versus some other condition. So in ours, it's during their mild pain sensation versus rest. Um, and then what we're able to look at is the change in the blood flow and the oxygenation levels using this type of imaging to see what areas are active. And the hypothesis with this is that patients will have something called augmented central pain processing. And this is something that's been shown in other disorders like low back pain or migraine or other types of disorders where there's pain, is that the pain regions of the brain are more active in people who have pain. And so that's what we're looking for to see if that occurs in MS. One possibility, if this initial study works out, is that we would be able to bring people in, try what we think might be the best medication for them, see if it quiets down this augmented central pain processing on the fMRI, if it doesn't, try another one, try another one, but maybe shorten that window of time from months where we're having to see does this work for the person, no, try another one, you know, for another few months, no, try another one, to shorten that down to hopefully a very, very short time period. And we don't know if that's going to be the case at all. We really don't know. There's tremendous progress. So just in the time that I've been working on MS, we've seen MRI come in to be part of the diagnostic criteria for the disease. That's greatly reduced the window between symptom onset and diagnosis, which is very important. So to be able to do earlier diagnosis and potentially earlier treatment, I think is very important. And then MRI has also been used to really expand our understanding of the disease, that it's not just about the white matter lesions, that there's other changes. And I think that's really helping direct our efforts at treatment 
to not just be lesion centric, but also to, to understand that there's other changes that could be targets for therapy. And I think we, we were just beginning the, the pain imaging research, but my hope is that, that it has the same promise, that we'll, we'll also learn uh, a lot about the disease and about what imaging can tell us and about the basis of pain and how to detect it earlier and treat earlier. Now, in terms of studying pain in MS, pain in MS may have several types of origins, and as a community, we need to understand that much better. We know that demyelinated axons become hyperexcitable. That's history, and that's easy. Why they become hyperexcitable, we know partly that has to do with a concept called impedance mismatch, where different parts of the fiber lose different amounts of myelin insulation. And we know from electrical engineering types of experiments that that will sometimes cause echoing or repetitive firing. But that doesn't get us to new medications. For new medications, we need target molecules that we can target with drugs. Uh, we don't yet understand the molecular drivers of pain in MS. Pain research is in the midst of a, a renaissance. It's an incredibly exciting time. In terms of pain due to injury to peripheral nerves, one form of neuropathic pain, we are able to identify single genes, one gene out of 30,000 that is causative. So we have gene, we know the molecule produced by that gene, and we have humans with intractable pain. It makes a wonderfully linear story, and it gives us a very, very well-defined set of molecules to try and target, and working with the pharmaceutical and biotech companies, uh, drugs are being developed to target the causative molecule. So it's one of those stories that uh, goes start to finish in a really, really exciting way. Uh, a next step in terms of MS is to find similar molecules that drive pain uh, in MS. We're not yet at the exciting time of that story. The Renaissance is still in front of us, but we're working to get there. In terms of future research, I really think think that a lot of these things are so connected, and by that I mean pain, depression, sleep problems, fatigue, cognitive issues, that I think we really need to start looking at research that is really trying to uh, address all of those, because none of those happen in isolation. They're really connected, and so some of our thoughts are how can we develop some treatments that target multiple symptoms. There's other things like sleep that really get in people's way and really reduce their quality of life. So I think in the future we need to be looking more, not at these things in isolation, but more what can we do about them. And, and a lot of the techniques we use can actually be used to, to help multiple things.